Okay, so welcome to inverse trig functions. And in this last section of our uh, trigonometry chapter, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore the inverse trigonometric functions. And it's very important um, that what I just said inverse trigonometric functions. Um, not only talking about inverse, which we previously discussed in our uh, chapter on functions, but also the <clears throat> the word functions, these inverse functions that we're gonna use. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go ahead and start with you know a warm up to kind of introduce us again to the inverse operation or the inverse functions that we had previously discussed. So it says graph, um, but actually in this first one, I am going to solve this algebraically, and then I'm going to look at the graph as far as applying the restrictions. So just remember um, the operations to go ahead and um, find the inverse is, you know, if you both have them set equal to y, then if it's not in function notation, then you replace the f of x with y. You go ahead and swap the variables, and then basically you sw and then you go ahead and solve for your variable y. So to undo the square root, I'm going to square both sides, okay? And then I get x squared is equal to y minus one, and then I'm going to add a one onto both sides. And therefore, I get my inverse function here, y inverse, which I'll use that notation, is going to equal to x squared plus one. Now, the important thing about this is understanding what this graph looks like. So if we we're gonna go ahead and graph the function and the inverse function on the same coordinate axis, right? So here we have, um, this is gonna be a square root function to the right one, so that is going to be our y function. And then our y inverse is actually the quadratic function, square root plus one. But that doesn't really work as the inverse because remember the inverse and its function are reflective about the y equals x line. So what we need to do is we need to add a restriction here. We need to add a restriction for the inverse of this for all, only to be x is greater than or equal to zero. So what that does is that eliminates this portion of our inverse function, right? So that is our idea of, of restrictions that we applied. Now, in addition, in this example, which is really the one we're gonna kind of most focus on, we automatically have an issue when we look at the graph and of solving the inverse. So when we go ahead and take a look at this graph here, x squared minus one, we realize that this graph is not one to one. It doesn't pass the horizontal asymptote test because if we try to reflect this graph across the y equals x line, what we get is we get a graph that is um, that does not pass the vertical line test, right? So it does not have a function. However, if we change this problem by adding a restriction, we can now create a function that has a inverse. So for instance, if I said y equals x squared minus one, where x is going to be greater than or equal to zero, well now, when I go ahead and graph this, I'm now I'm graphing this function right here. Well now that is one to one. So now I can go ahead and reflect that about the y equals x line. And when I do that, I get this equation right here. Okay, so the important thing is what we did is we applied the operation to make this um, invertible to be able to find the inverse. The other thing that I wanted to mention to you is that each of these operations that we did, when we looked into solving this, you know, when we solve this for the inverse, we applied each of these inverse operations. And that kind of goes back to our core of algebra one and algebra two. You know, when we square both sides, the reason why we're squaring both sides is because we're trying to undo the square root, which the squaring and square root is the inverse operations. These are inverse algebraic operations. To undo subtracting, we are using the inverse operation of subtraction, which is addition. So we use our inverse operations to undo a um, undo an operation, right? And that's basically the idea of a function and its function inverse is the a function inverse undoes the operations of the function. So we want to kind of take that point. And then our other point that we want to take, if a function is not invertible, meaning you do not have its inverse, you can apply certain restrictions. Now, this isn't the only restriction we could have applied. We also could have said, well, why don't we just do, you know, x squared minus one, and then x is less than or equal to zero. Or we could have done y is equal to x squared you know, minus one, and then we could say, well, the restriction here is going to be from, you know, zero to, you know, I don't know, two, 
Like you can make any restriction up, right? And obviously if you didn't have the restriction though, you did not have a inverse. So that was the important thing is we needed to have a, um, a, a restriction on there. And again, that only works for in functions when they are not one-to-one. -one. But that causes a problem when we look at our trigonometric functions because we realize for all of these trigonometric functions, they are, none of them are one-to-one. -one. They all fail the horizontal asymptote test. So then the question comes into, you know, we can go ahead and try to apply, um, you know, reflecting these about the y equals x line to kind of see what they're going to look like but they're not going to have an inverse. And I'm gonna to try to do my best here of reflecting these across the y equals x line. I'm gonna change this to one and negative one because the scale of this graph is off. So let's just change this to negative one and positive one, okay? So if I was to take this graph, right, and basically invert this across the y, or flip this across the y equals x line, then I'm basically going to um, go ahead and, or actually let's do it up here, sorry. If I take this graph and reflect this about the y equals x line, take this graph and reflect it about the y equals x line, and this one. So let's actually undo this. Actually, I'm gonna leave my y, or my scale there, because I still want the scale to be there. Okay, what is this graph now going to go ahead and look like? Like that's kind of the important thing. And what we can kind of see here is remember we know these asymptotes here is at pi halves. This is for the tangent function and at negative pi halves, right? So if we were to go ahead and uh, invert this, So we know the asymptotes, so I guess I'll just put it there. We know these asymptotes for here, this asymptote and this asymptote occur at negative pi halves and at pi halves. So if I go ahead and invert this, I'm gonna have an equation that's gonna look something like this. And then obviously that repeats. So we have a asymptote here at pi halves and we'd have another asymptote at negative pi halves. Right? And then what happens is that just keeps on repeating itself. So then we'd have this function here, and then we'd have another function here, and it get, looks pretty messy. But you can see, obviously, the inversion here is not going to work, right? Um, in the same respect here, if I was to go ahead and flip this graph across the y equals x line, all right, um, I'm trying to see as far as my cosine graph, I always get these, these are always like, so different, this point goes like right here. Oh, this, oh, that's, oh, it's kind of difficult here because that's not your one, but this graph, these would be reflected. So it's gonna look something like this. Now again, remember this has a maximum of one and a minimum of negative one. So that means my new intervals here would be from negative one to one, like on a new axis. Same thing um, goes again here, which I have to always like look at this as far as the reflection here. This graph is gonna look something like that. And I don't really have the best graphing things. But again, the important thing that I want you to really see is this is gonna go from negative one to one. All right, so I actually have the graphs, you know, kind of presented for you that we can kind of take a look at. But the important thing here is these graphs are, we can't, we. We can't find the inverse here where they're at. So we have to restrict them. Now, how are we going to restrict them? Like what are we going to erase? Because for the, you know, for the quadratic, we there there's infinite many um, intervals. And the same thing here, like we could take a chunk out of cosine and say that is going to be what we want. That is our restriction. Or we could take another chunk out of cosine. But the problem is if we're talking about an inverse function, a it's, it's a function. So we're going to have to be consistent. And the implied um, domain restriction that we use across the board that we have programmed, you know, for our calculators to apply is, is going to be set for us. And that restriction um, for the tangent is going to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. So what that means is we are basically restricting this cosine graph. Um, uh, so let's go and erase these because this doesn't work here. So I'll kind of show you what this looks like because that looks kind of confusing.
So what we do is we're going to restrict the uh, tangent graph. Oh, I wrote that wrong. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't notice that. That's tangent and that's sine. So what we do is we're going to restrict this between negative pi halves and pi halves, where the asymptotes occur. So therefore, all the rest of this we are not going to include. We are only going to look at the domain, we're only going to look at the domain of tangent between negative pi halves and pi halves. So now, when I go ahead and invert this, I'm now going to have a graph that's going to look like this. And now you can see that that is a vertical line. And that is going to go as high as pi halves and as low as negative pi halves. Okay? In the same reason. So now when looking at the domain here, so this is going to be your graph of this is y equals our tangent inverse. And that is a tangent inverse function, right? So that's important. That's why it has to pass that vertical line test. And when we look at this, we can in, um, actually, I already talked about the domain range, don't I? Oh, well, I'll just going right in there. So the domain here of this function is from negative infinity to infinity. And the range, though, is from negative pi halves to pi halves. All right. Now let's go and look at cosine. Where can we restrict cosine? So therefore, it is going to be um, always going to have an invertible function. And the way that we're, what we're going to do is we're going to restrict it from 0 to pi. I guess that was my point here. That, or that would have been 0. That would have been 2 pi. Here's pi. There you go. Oops. So we're going to restrict. Uh, let's write it from there. We're going to restrict it from 0 to pi. So now when we invert this, so when we go ahead and invert that, what we're going to get is we're going to get a inverse function graph that's going to look like this. All right. And again, you can see that's going to go like the max and the min here for, is from one to one. So when we invert this, when we reflect this about the y-axis, it's going to go from one to negative one. The lowest point now is going to be from zero to pi. So when we look at the domain here, our domain is going to be from negative 1 to 1. And our range, which is the restricted domain from our cosine function, is going to be now restricted from 0 to pi. OK? Um, da, 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 da. So this is going to be our y equals cosine inverse graph. And then let's go and look at sine. And the implied um, restriction for sine is going to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. So I'll say pi halves and negative pi halves. And I'll do pi to 0. So when we take this function and we reflect it about the y equals x axis, now what we're going to get is we're going to get an angle, or we're going to get a function that's going to look something like this. I'll try to, yeah, I'll pick it from there. That again is going to go as low as negative pi halves all the way up to pi halves. So that is, if you take this function and reflect it about the y equals x line, that is what you'd get. Again, discounting the rest of this function. Just taking between negative pi halves and pi halves. Again, discounting the rest of this function. Just taking between 0 and pi. So when we look at this here, the domain of this function is again going to be from negative 1 to 1. But the range, which is from the restriction of sine, is going to be from negative pi halves to pi halves. Okay? So that is going to be your what your inverse function for sine looks like. All right? So now why what does all this mean? So again, the inverse cosine, inverse sine, inverse tan, we use this like kind of negative one as our notation. But we could also use arc cosine. We could also use arc sine and arc tan. Okay. Um, obviously, that is not included. There's asymptotes there. So the important thing, though, is that it has. We're dealing with a restriction, right? So these inverse functions, these range is restricted from the original function because the original functions, you know, had no restrictions. 
And so therefore they had no inverse. So we had to restrict the domain of the um, trigonometric functions. So therefore we can find the inverse. So it's very important when we're thinking about these inverse, we are dealing with a restriction. And another way that I like to kind of look at this is in terms of like, let's look at, um, let's look at the restrictions of theta. Okay. So the restrictions of theta is basically like the restrictions of our range here. So if we're going to go back to like the unit circle, all right, so I'm just going to say like your theta restrictions So these are our theta restrictions and I'll do tangent, I'll do sine, and I will do cosine. All right, so when we're looking at the theta restrictions of, our ang of an angle, if we're trying to evaluate the inverse, um, inverse tangent, for instance, well, you know, if I'm trying to do the tangent inverse of some value, then I have a restriction on the tangent function and the restrictions on that angle has to be between negative pi halves and pi halves. Basically meaning that that angle has to fall within the first and the fourth quadrant. And again, look at it. We restricted, we're restricting the tangent of x between negative pi halves and pi halves. Well, when you look at that in terms of like the unit circle, the angle negative pi half to pi halves is angles, any angles within the first and the fourth quadrant. When you look at this in terms of sine, let's see, well, how did we restrict sine? We decided to restrict sine again, also between negative pi halves and pi halves. And again, that is to make this a vertical have pass invertible. So if we restrict the, the sine function between negative pi halves and pi halves, so we can evaluate the sine inverse, that again is going to restrict our angles for inverse of sine, for sine inverse, to be between the first and the fourth quadrant. However, cosine's different because if we restricted cosine between negative pi halves and pi halves, when we reflect that, you'd see it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. So therefore, the implied, do, the implied domain restriction for cosine is between zero and pi. So when we're looking at cosine inverse, we're dealing with a restricted domain from cosine of zero to pi. And if we look at zero to pi on the unit circle, we see that that is in the first two quadrants, okay? Now, I think of these restrictions as like, um, it's kind of like the cage, like you can't leave, you have to stay within there. Because again, you know, it's like going, you know, going back again to this original warm up problem. Like we could not do anything with x squared unless we applied one of these restrictions, right? We, we could not find the inverse of an x squared problem unless we applied a restriction, all right? So, and now in each of these problems, we, we, gave it an, 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 we gave it a restriction and then we could go ahead and work through the problem. So, but once we have that restriction, you know, then we can go ahead and work on it, but we have to still remain within that restriction, right? We can't like say, okay, here's my restriction, but then I'm now not gonna, not gonna use that restriction at all. Like that restriction stays with your invertible function when you find the inverse. That is the same case here. Like we have these restrictions, like for the sine cosine tangent, we have to restrict them. So therefore we can obtain the tangent inverse, cosine inverse and sine inverse. But how we restricted them, negative pi halves to pi halves, zero to pi and negative pi halves to pi halves remains with these inverse functions. So it, it, you know, it's, it gets better as we start working through problems. It's just very important to remember that the angles when evaluating for the tangent inverse, sine inverse, and cosine inverse are working off of restricted, restricted angles for sine, cosine, and tangent. All right. So, um, you know, I think of these as like cage, like you have to stay within them. And, you know, that's something that we'll kind of, you know, work on. We have to fall within those restrictions. So I think it's a little bit easier sometimes also just to kind of work through some problems and just kind of see how these restrictions play out. Sometimes they're going to make an impact and then sometimes they don't make any impact at all. So, um, let's go ahead and look into the first example and kind of see how that helps us out.